So let's just jump right into scripture this morning. If you have a Bible or have one near you, um, you can turn with me to Philippians 4, starting in verse 4. And this is a passage that I know you've heard thousands of times. I know Susie has brought it to us a number of times before our prayer time. Um, But it's kind of been ringing in my mind a lot these last few weeks, so I thought we'd look at it together today. So Philippians 4, verse 4, it says, Rejoice in the Lord always. I'll say it again, rejoice. Let your gentleness be evident to all. The Lord is near. Do not be anxious about anything, but in every situation, by prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, present your requests to God. And the peace of God, which transcends all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Finally, brothers and sisters, whatever is true, whatever is noble, whatever is right, whatever is pure, Whatever is lovely, whatever is admirable, if anything is excellent or praiseworthy, think about those things. Whatever you've learned or received or heard from me or seen in me, put it into practice. And the God of peace will be with you. Let's pray. God, we thank you for these words of of peace from Philippians. And we ask that you teach us from them this morning. Teach us more about who you are and who we are as your children. In your name we pray. Amen. So I have what my husband will tell you is a genetic disorder. It's called the Kelder worry gene. So <laughs> Kelder is my maiden name. And this, this worry gene has been passed down from my grandparents to my parents and now to my siblings and me. And we all just worry way more than we want to or should. <laughs> There's, it's interesting because I'm, I'm usually pretty a positive person. I have a pretty positive outlook on life. And so usually what happens is when something changes in my life or when something new happens or something's coming up, about 90% of me is really excited. I get excited and I'm, I'm looking forward to what God is going to do next. And then there's always this really loud, nagging 10% of my mind that just keeps asking, what if? You know, what if this happens? Or what if this doesn't happen? Or what if I fail? Or what if I succeed? Then what do I do? Just what if, what if, what if in this 10% part of my brain. So lately, Jeremy and I just bought a house, as many of you know, and about 90% of me is all in. I'm really excited and it just feels like the right thing. It felt like the right next step for our lives and our life in Seattle felt like the right next thing to do for our ministry. It's the right house in the right neighborhood. But then there's that 10% that just keeps thinking, oh boy, what if this house is too small in a few years? Or what if it really wasn't a great idea to move into the house across the street from the Boys and Girls Club that has 150 kids every day? Or what if what if something breaks? And the night before we closed on Thursday night, I had these awful dreams of getting into the house and they had taken all the appliances and they knocked down the living room wall and all this crazy stuff. Just what if, what if, what if. And you can bet I can tell you all kinds of things we can worry about with Harbor Church. (laughs) I'm I'm not a parent, but being one of the pastors in a new church, in a church plant, is what I imagine being a parent of a toddler feels like. You know, where we've been here a few years, we've got some things down, you know, Sunday morning usually goes pretty well, and we've got some rhythms happening during the week, but we're still pretty new, you know, and there are still... Lots of things that we're learning and lots of things we're experimenting with. And 90% of me is really excited. You know, 90% of me loves being in this church and loves seeing where God will take us next and seeing how he grows us and who he brings next. But then there's that 10% that just goes, what if we don't get these finances figured out? And what if everyone just stops coming? Or what if, you know, what if the kids in the back hate what they end up doing and they never want to come again. You know, what if, what if, what if? There's my Kelder worry gene. So if I'm being totally honest, this sermon is probably mostly me talking to myself and you guys get to listen, but I would imagine that some of you would relate to that. You know, I think all of us at some point, maybe not as often as me and my family, but at some point we worry and we feel anxious. And what God is saying to us in this passage this morning is all of those what-ifs, all of that anxiety isn't what God wants for our lives. 
And so here he's laid out kind of the antidote to worry in this passage this morning. So God, God doesn't want us to worry. God doesn't want us to be constantly asking, what if this happens or what if this doesn't happen? He wants something else for our lives. And why? Because, as this passage says, the Lord is near. The God of peace is with us. I have those lines highlighted in yellow in my Bible because I think they're the key to this antidote to worry. The Lord is near. And so instead of worrying, God gives us some other things we can spend our time doing with that 10% of our minds. And the first one that he says is to pray. One of the best ways that we have to remember that God is near to us is prayer. If you were here, I don't know, a month or so ago, Jeremy had a great sermon on prayer, and he reminded us that prayer is an act of dependence on God. To pray to God is to admit that we can't do it all on our own, and we need God's help. And when we pray, we recognize that God is near, and so we can trust that he'll hear and will he'll answer those prayers. And that prayer can bring us peace. I don't know if you've ever had that before. I know I have where I'm worrying about something, or I'm feeling anxious, and then I pray and I just feel better. It doesn't mean everything is solved. It doesn't mean I got the answer in a lightning bolt or something, but I just feel better. I feel peace. I, when, I used to think about peace as um, just having no problems, you know, kind of the hakuna matata way of thinking about life. There's no worries, everything's fine. That's what peace is. And I think we often talk about peace that way. You know, when we say two nations are at peace, we mean they're not at war, right? They're not fighting with each other. They're just kind of living in harmony with each other, and it's fine. There's no struggle happening. Or if we lose someone we love, if someone passes away, we find comfort in saying, finally, they're at peace. Their struggle is over, and they are at peace. And that's true, and that's important. But I think that the Bible, when it talks about peace, is talking about something a little less black and white, a little more nuanced. One of my favorite authors and pastors and theologians is Friedrich Buchner, and he once wrote that peace isn't the absence of struggle. Peace is the presence of love. Peace is that recognition that the Lord is near. When we feel peace, when we pray and we feel peace, it doesn't take away the problem. It doesn't necessarily answer all of our questions in that moment. But we recognize that God is near and God is with us. And instead of removing our struggles, God brings his love to surround us. And we feel peace. That's what I think this passage is talking about. And it's kind of a freeing thought, isn't it? You know, peace to me for a long time seemed like this really, really hard thing to have because how can you never have any struggles? How can everything just constantly be okay? But if peace is recognizing that the Lord is near, recognizing that his love is around us, then we can have peace. We can have that, that dream that God has for our lives, that we would be at peace. I had that experience a couple weeks ago when I came here for a worship rehearsal, actually. It was in the midst of all of this house stuff and some other things happening. It had been kind of a frustrating day, and so I came with lots of anxiety and lots of worry and lots of questions. And Jeremy usually starts a worship rehearsal with prayer, but this particular week he asked us to sing a song together. So we sang How Great Is Our God, just kind of a cappella, just together as a team. And as I repeated that chorus, just how great, how great is our God, I just felt this overwhelming sense of peace. It wasn't like I got any answers to my questions. It wasn't like the things that had frustrated me earlier that day hadn't happened. But I just re I remembered. God reminded me that he was there. And so that peace came, not in the absence of struggle, but in the presence of love. And I think that's what the Bible means when it talks about peace. So that's, that's the first step in God's antidote to worry, that we can pray and seek out God's peace, realizing that God is near. But then the second one, God basically says, think about something else. <laughs> Don't worry about anything, but think about whatever is good and true and noble and right and pure and praiseworthy and excellent. Think about those things instead. The one that really stuck out to me this week as I was kind of living in this passage is, 
Think about whatever is true. So often, at least for me, my worries are about things that aren't even necessarily true. They're all speculation, you know, a fear that this could happen or something that I hope doesn't happen. But God says, focus on what's true. Focus on what you know. Focus on all of the truth that God has placed around us in the world. That's what God calls us to. But there's more. It also says, think about what's noble and right and pure and lovely and admirable and excellent and praiseworthy. All of these things that God has set out in front of us. It's like God gives us a new focus to reframe our lives. I, I went to the eye doctor a few months ago, and I, I went because I had been getting a lot of headaches, and it had been a couple years since I had a checkup, so I assumed that my prescription for my contacts and my glasses was wrong. Um, or old. And so I went and they did the checkup and every, it turned out my prescription was fine, but what they found was the muscles in my eyes that helped me switch from focusing up close to focusing far away, those muscles had gotten weak. And apparently what it was was about four years of seminary where all I did was read and sit on my computer, but it had made my eyes weak and so I couldn't focus on what was way ahead of me. I could only focus here. And so what the doctor told me to do was, whenever I was reading a book or looking at something up close, just every few minutes, really focus on my book and then look out the window and focus at something else. And then go back to my book and then back up and up and down to kind of give my muscles in my eyes a workout. And I've, I've been doing that and it's been fine and my eyes have gotten better and I'm not getting headaches, but it's, it's worked. But I think when we worry, what we're doing is keeping our focus right here, right in front of us. And we're hurting those muscles that help us look out and see what God has for us in the world. When we're worried and we're so consumed with our anxieties, we, we just get stuck right here. And we miss looking out and seeing all of the things that God has done that are true and lovely and admirable and praiseworthy. We miss seeing all of those things that God is doing in the greater world around us and all those things he calls us to run after in our lives. Because all we can do is focus right here. So I think this passage calls us, it's like, it's like God is saying, hey, give your eyes a workout. You know, give those muscles a workout. Stop looking at what's right here. Stop looking at just this little bubble around you that you've created with your worries and instead look out and see all that's good and true and worthy and excellent and admirable. All these things that are out into the world. God gives us a new focus for our lives and a new way of looking at the world around us so we can see all of this beauty in God's world. But then here's the clincher. And this is something I had never noticed in this passage before. I've memorized this passage in scripture. I was, is anyone a Steve Green fan here? Do you remember him? I had this Steve Green tape. I don't know if you've ever heard of it. Anyway, I had a Steve Green tape, and he had a little song about this that I could sing for you, but I won't. Um, but I've, I've memorized this passage over and over, but it always stops at think about such things. But I think these last few sentences are really, really important. It says, whatever you've learned or received or heard from me or seen in me, put it into practice. Put it into practice, and the God of peace will be with you. I don't know until I was, I was digging into this passage this week, I don't know that I've ever noticed that part of this passage. Put it into practice. This is Paul writing this letter to the Philippians, and we probably all know that Paul did all kinds of incredible things. You know, he was a missionary, an apostle, and an evangelist, and he was advancing God's church after Jesus' death. And um, Paul is saying to the Philippians, all of these things that you've seen me do, don't just think about them, don't just observe them, but come with me. Join me in God's ministry. Put it into practice. God is saying it's not enough just to think about these things. It's not enough just to notice all of the truth and goodness and righteousness and things that are admirable and lovely in the world. It's not enough just to think about them. We need to go that extra step and put them into practice. 
that's a really hard step to take, I think. It can be really tempting to, to see what God is doing and to look at it and to think about it or to observe other people doing beautiful things and incredible ministries in the world and not take that step with them. I think, you know, sometimes we talk about people being guilty by association, right? And I think sometimes we can think that we do ministry by association. You know, my, my pastor does this really cool thing, or my sister is involved in this really great ministry, or I'm a, I'm a part of this group of friends that do all these amazing things for, God, for God's kingdom. And I think that sometimes it's tempting to think, well, because I know them or because I'm part of them, that I'm in that ministry too. But what God is calling us here is to put them into practice ourselves not just to observe the ministry or to think about the ministry or to, to see what God is doing and just be grateful for it, but to come, to run towards it and put it into practice in our own lives. There's one more step. And then, then it says the God of peace will be with you. That's part of God's full antidote for worry for us. God calls us to put these things into practice. And I think that when we walk into those things, when we run to the things that are true and beautiful and noble, then we will know God's peace. And I think that's God's antidote for worry for us, for me, with our house and with Harvard Church and for, for all of us with whatever you might be worrying about this morning. God says, pray. Look at, look at what I'm doing in the world. Look for the beauty and the truth and things that are admirable, and then put those things into practice in your own life. So, will you do that with me? Amen. Let's pray. God, we thank you for your, your peace. And we thank you that we can rejoice and give thanks for what you're doing in our lives. And God, we ask you that you give us the boldness and the courage to put them into practice to join you in your ministry and your work in the world. Let us leave here transformed into what you would have us be. In your name we pray. Amen.